Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we'll be discussing nematodes, and we'll discuss their biology in general, and something about their classification, just to give you an idea of where all these seem to fit in terms of the scheme of life. To begin with, most nematodes are free-living, and in fact, 99% of all the nematode species that we know of are not parasitic. An ecologist once said, that if one were to take away all of Earth's solid matter from the crust of the Earth and leave only nematodes that live in soil, the Earth's continents would still be visible when viewed from 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. That's how many nematodes there are in soil. Nematodes are absolutely essential for creating soil. They ingest microbial life. They create excrement, which in this case turns out to be fertilizer. And they can then break down small particles with their excrement and their metabolism. When they themselves die and release all of their lytic products, it helps to process soil and to make it what it is, and a matrix for the growth of other things. And as I mentioned earlier in the introductory uh, uh, presentation on helminths, the, the, the uh, poster child for nematodes is Sanorebitis elegans, and there's no question about that we know more about this one nematode than we do about any other nematode. But of course, it's not a parasite, so we'll have to avoid all the references to Sanorebitis from now on. So nematodes are classified along these lines. It's, of course, an animal, and it's, of course, a eukaryote. And as we get down to here, it has its own phylum for nematoda. So nematode classification in the old days, back in Linnaeus's time, as up until the modern era of genomics, was based entirely on morphology and life cycles. But today we have another way of looking at life, of course, and the new scheme is based on small subunit ribosomal DNA that encodes the small subunit for ribosomes. And if we then took that sequence and reclassified all of these nematodes, they would fall out into different groups. Not significantly different from the morphological ones, but different enough to make a difference. How's that? If you want to see more details of this, here are two good references for you. So the current revised nematode classification based on genomic relationships is shown here. And every time we see this little mammal, it represents a nematode group which actually infects mammals. Sometimes they infect other life forms too, but in most cases, uh, the ones that we're worried about, like down over here, for instance, uh, Trichinella group, uh, infects only mammals. Uh, and very few nematode groups are, are more widely birthed in terms of their life cycles than mammals and perhaps an intermediate host, as we'll get to. So let's talk about some general characteristics of nematodes first. Now, I conducted most of my own research on nematodes, so I'm rather familiar with the general scheme of their life cycles. They all undergo four molts, starting with a first stage larva, then to the second, third, and fourth stage larva. Each one is punctuated by a molt and a growth stage, until finally, after the fourth molt, the nematode becomes an adult male or an adult female. As I mentioned before, all the nematodes are non-segmented, so that's how you can tell them apart from other life forms. Most nematode species lay eggs, while some also give birth to live offspring. And in fact, there's one Capillaria philippinensis, which begins by giving off live offspring, and then as the immune system kicks in, it starts to produce eggs. So this is one that can do both. So many parasitic uh, nematode species live in the gastrointestinal tract, either in the small or large intestine, and we'll see plenty of examples of those as we work our way down through the nematode species that cause diseases in humans. Some of them even infect tissues. A few live in the bloodstream or lymphatics. And only two nematode species that I can think of, and I hope that I've covered all of them, um, Strongyloides stercoralis and Capillaria philippinensis, begin as a single worm and can actually reproduce inside the same host to make more adults from a single worm infection. And that's an unusual characteristic for nematodes. The vast majority of the parasitic nematodes 
begin as a, an egg or as a larva that's introduced by a vector, and it results in a single worm. That worm then produces offspring, which leaves that host and goes on to complete the life cycle outside the original infected host. We'll see these life cycles as they come up, and they're, they're fascinating to look at because as we evolved, they evolved. Hello again. Now, I'm going to be with you presenting clinical cases in the next several lectures. And a lot of the clinical man manifestations that we're going to see are actually going to be based on the niche that the uh, parasite might be uh, occupying. We might see enlargement of the liver and spleen, hepatosplenomegaly. As we go forward, people will quickly think of what that might be. But at this point, this is all before us. We might see a patient developing a cholangiocarcinoma of the bile duct because of a particular tropism of one of our parasites. We might see tracts through the liver, a parasite that likes to migrate through and feed on the liver cells. Patient might develop lesions in the lungs and even with hemoptysis, coughing up of blood. Or we might have a patient develop diarrhea. So as we go forward, we'll be presenting various clinical cases thinking about which parasites might head to those niches and might give us these clinical uh, symptoms and signs. If you want to learn a lot more about parasitic nematodes, here's an entire uh, volume dedicated to the biology and the molecular biology and pathology of nematode infections that I highly recommend. It's rather comprehensive. And so next time we'll begin our journey through the elementary tract with one of the most benign of the parasites that infect humans, pinworm. Thanks for listening.